it's 2023, and there's one question on everyone's mind. Why is Beric Dondarrion still alive? No, no, not, not that Beric Dondarrion. This Beric Dondarrion. Yeah, that's right. It's a TV show episode. So I, noted random internet guy, random internet guy, was watching a show that I, random internet guy, famously like and enjoy. And I was struck by some strange occurrences surrounding Lord Beric Dondarrion, specifically in Season 3, Episode 6, titled The Climb. This episode is famously the one in which Egret and John climb the wall, while in the background a fantastic voiceover from Peter Baelish plays. This is also famously the episode where Theon gets his uh, pinky finger um, uh, liberated. Don't think about it too much. What you should think about quite a bit is the scene where Beric and Thoros of Mir meet Melisandre for the first time. It's a dramatic meeting as Mel comes to an understanding that Thoros and the Lord of Light have brought back Beric Dondarrion not once, but six times. And this scene is so good that we're going to read it verbatim. Ready? Here we go. You should not have this power, says Melisandre to Thoros. I have no power. I ask the Lord for his favor, and he responds as he will. I've always been a terrible priest. It's a terrible thing to say, but by the time I came to Westeros, I didn't believe in our Lord. I decided that he, that, that all the gods were stories we told the children to make them behave. So I wore the robes, and every now and then I'd recite the prayers, but it was just for show. A spectacle for the locals. Until the mountain drove a lance through this one's heart. I knelt beside his cold body and said the old words, not because I believed in them, but because he was my friend and he was dead. <laughs> they were the only words I knew. And for the first time in my life, the Lord replied. Beric's eyes opened and I knew the truth. Our God is the one true God. And all men must serve him. Melisandre turns to Beric and says, You have been to the other side. The other side? I have been to the darkness, my lady. There is no other side. And Melisandre replies, He sent you to us for a reason. You have someone he needs. Man, you guys remember when that show was good? She ends that speech with the phrase, You have someone he needs. In the context of the show, that turns out to be Gendry Baratheon. Because in the very next scene, in the very next shot, in fact, we are smash cut directly to Arya, Gendry, and Tom of Seven Strings practicing their archery. And it is in that scene that Melisandre arrives and takes Gendry in exchange for the gold. In fact, Thoros has that fantastic line where Arya is like, I thought you served the realm, but you're just doing this for gold. And he says, we're doing this for both, my lady. But, and here's the issue. Whether we take Gendry Baratheon from the show or his counterpart in the book, who appears to be Edric Storm in this context, it doesn't seem like that pans out. You have someone that the Lord of Light needs. Referring to Gendry Baratheon, Gendry Baratheon, over the course of the rest of the series, did nothing. Absolutely nothing. So in the context of the show, this appears to be a little bit of a misdirect. It's not Gendry that is the person that the Lord of Light needs. It ends up being Arya. Because in that same scene where Gendry is taken, this is the scene in which Melisandre delivers the prophecy to Arya about brown eyes, blue eyes, and green eyes being shut forever. So, perhaps we found our answer. Beric Dondarrion, as we know, was kept alive six times this individual was resurrected so that he could help to facilitate the actions of Arya Stark at the end of his life. And at that time, at the end of this storyline, we see these three characters reunited with 
uh, Arya being the one to kill the Night King, uh, Melisandre referencing this prophecy, but in a slightly different order. I believe he goes brown eyes, green eyes, blue eyes to signify the importance that was meant the whole time from that blue eyes statement. And of course, Beric Dondarrion inconveniencing some zombies, shall we say. It turns out that after all of this, that his destiny was slowing down a horde of zombies for two or three minutes. Wait a minute. And was Hodor's magically induced destiny too? No, 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 we can't get sidetracked. We'll come back to that later. Beric appears to die in the show, saving the world, or at least playing his role in saving the world. And his role in saving the world is as a minor inconvenience so an 18-year-old edgelord can make it to the next loading zone, but he fulfills this role admirably. But here, dear viewer, is where I am going to pull the wool from your eyes. I am not, in fact, random internet guy. No, no, I am Bob Ross, and I have pulled a little sneaky on you. Because this is not a show episode. This is a book episode all along. Because this destiny, this terrible, disappointing destiny, is not what has happened thus far in the books. Beric Dondarrion is dead, yes, but he was raised not six times, but seven Beric Dondarrion dies not just to become a glorified doorstop for a horde of Black Friday shoppers, no, no, no. Beric Dondarrion dies as a consequence of the effort it took raising one of the worst people in the story from the dead. Not Catelyn, who is delightful, but Lady Stoneheart, who is the embodiment of rage and vengeance without mercy. He put a piece of his soul, he burned what was left of himself to bring this individual back. And that, dear viewer, is the question that I wish to answer today. Why? Beric Dondarrion was leading an army of outlaws, hell-bent on restoring peaceful rule to Westeros while causing as little harm to the citizens of Westeros as possible. They won't steal food and raid farms like the Lannisters will, or, frankly, like in many cases the Starks were forced to do. They will buy food from the populaces. They have a war to fight, but they're doing everything in their power to keep the burden off of the people they're trying to protect. Now compare that to Lady Stoneheart, who is basically the opposite of Beric Dondarrion. She is fighting to hurt people. She is fighting for vengeance, and anyone who is not either helping her to achieve that vengeance or the people she is enacting vengeance on is just an obstacle to obtaining that. She might be as far from Beric as a person can get. So I ask again, why? It is strictly worse for Westeros that Catelyn has been raised. Small sidebar, that is not to say that I do not enjoy the character of Lady Stoneheart. She's one of my favorites in the series. But she is a bad person. Tywin Lannister is a bad person, but almost incidental to his leadership style is relative peace and prosperity for the common folk most of the time. Whereas Catelyn seems to embody the idea of war for war's sake. Frays are being butchered. The spirit of vengeance is on a rampage. But the people who are at fault are not the ones that Catelyn is targeting. The people who started the war like Joffrey when he removed Ned's head and Peter telling Lysa to tell Cat that the Lannister sent the cat's paw, which was definitely sent by Peter to ensure that this would happen. We're getting off topic again. So, now we've set the stage. Why is this spirit of vengeance Catelyn Stark still alive? Why was Beric Dondarrion perhaps the most good character in the series? Question mark? Fight about that in the comments. Why was this character driven to this point by supernatural, maybe even religious means? Why? Does Lady Stoneheart, this fantastic villain raised from the bones of one of the best characters in the series and imbued with the life force of one of the most morally positive characters in the series, does, does she exist just to die? To be heroically murdered by Jaime Lannister or Arya Stark like Peter Baelish in the show? No, I don't buy it. She's back for a reason, and I hope you have your tinfoil hat strapped on because I'm about to speculate. The way I see it, there's two options. Number one, 
Many people speculate on the possibility that Lightbringer will be reforged from the bones of ice. That being the sword that is currently in the Red Keep and the sword that is currently in Brienne's possession with Jaime. And this lends a little bit of credence to the Jaime becomes Azora High. It could be interesting if, uh, by Gendry's hand, ice is reforged and Jaime uses it to slay Lady Stoneheart with her taking on the Nissa Nissa qualities. Then, this life force that has survived seven deaths is the life force that is used to recreate Lightbringer from the reforged ice. This would then be a sword that was at one point both ice and fire, wielded in the hands of a prince, that being Jaime, the brother of a queen, to combat the darkness that Jaime and Brienne see in their dreams. Very tidy, especially the seven deaths bit, but there's a problem. Because... Lightbringer, in the original story, is quenched in the lifeblood of Nissa Nissa, Azor High's wife. But, because Lady Stoneheart is not Jamie's wife, put your fanfics away, you stop it, you stop it right now, put them away, maybe Jamie uses the reforged ice to kill Cersei, which would be very compelling, and that is the sacrifice that revives Lightbringer. But if we go that way, then while that may be an interesting theory, and it's very exciting, it's worth exploring, if we go that way, we still haven't answered the question. Why is Lady Stoneheart still alive? Well, for my final point, I want to return to something that we discussed early in that lengthy quote from the show. Quote, You should not have this power, says Melisandre. And Thoros responds, I have no power. I ask the Lord for his favor and he responds as he will. This suggests to me, in really no uncertain terms, that Thoros, by his admission, and Melisandre, by her astonishment in this scene, um, have no idea what they're doing. But you may say to me, random internet guy, what does this have to do with anything? This is the show. We're talking about the books now. Well, at this point in the show's progression, George R. R. Martin was still on staff. He would, in fact, go on to write the episode immediately after this, The Bear and the Maiden Fair. But we're not here talking about Brienne and Address. We are talking about the fact that Thoros and Melisandre appear in this scene to have no idea what they're doing when it comes to the powers that they're dealing with. And this is in a scene that must needs have been George R.R. R. Martin approved at some point. So, I want you to imagine, just for a moment... Instead of Thoros and Melisandre saying this, I have no power, I ask the Lord for his favor, and he responds as he will. Instead of having these interesting, comfortable, Catholicism sort of trappings, I want you to imagine this was Euron Greyjoy saying this. I reach out into the dark. I have no power, but I reach out into the dark, and the darkness responds as it will. It is played up, the Lord of Light in this context is played up all nice and friendly and pleasant. But in reality, Thoros has no idea what he's doing. By his own admission, he didn't believe in these powers beforehand. The only thing that he has to go on is the fact that something threw Beric back. And it doesn't appear by her astonishment at how many times he has been brought back, that Melisandre has any more information about this herself. I assert that whatever brought Beric back, whatever compelled Thoros to bring Beric back, is not the Lord of Light, but is something very dark and very scary. And we see more of that very dark and very scary bleeding into Beric's personality. The more times he's brought back, the less of a person he seems to be. And we see that very strongly in Lady Stoneheart, who no longer seems to be a person at all. These are all ominous things. The Red Priests meddle with things they don't understand. They slap a lovely label on it and call it the Will of Relore. But this scene demonstrates what we as book readers already know. 
that when faced with true miracles, real, world-shifting magic like we're seeing here, Melanthoros are ants in a hurricane. And I contend that that hurricane is not as friendly as Melisandre seems to think it is. In fact, if it turned out that Melisandre was wrong not just about the types of visions that she's getting, not just about the nature of those visions, but I think it would be very George Martin if it turned out that she was wrong about the thing in the dark giving them to her. Well, I hope you've liked and commented and smashed that bell icon because I am about to go all the way off the rails. Suppose, just for a moment, suppose that we wanted to merge these two theories. Ice is Lightbringer, Cat, who has been brought back seven times by something dark, needs to be slain by the reforged ice, and so that the power of these seven deaths is imbued into the blade by her husband. That's right. Reforged ice in the hands of the reanimated bones of Ned Stark kills Catelyn Stark, becomes Lightbringer, Ned Stark equals Night's King equals Azor High equals Ned Stark. Happy April Fool's Day. Goodbye.